Hello. So it's ironic that the last time I did a video, a couple of days ago now, I was talking about habits, um, obsessions um, versus and habits that you have. Because um, in the last three weeks, I will say, I started drinking soda again after a very long, long pause of drinking soda. And over the last week, I've noticed that I have slept quite a bit. I've been less motivated, really had to push myself. And and thinking about it and tracing it, I think it goes back to drinking soda again. It's made me lethargic. I'm just not getting accomplished the things I want to get accomplished. <clears throat> it started on a night when I wrote a script that I drank soda again on the night that I wrote my uh, most recent script. First one I've really finished in a while. The one that I've gotten pretty good feedback from, although it's clearly not for women in the 50 plus range, <laughs> at least from the people I've spoken with. But I drank soda that night that I was writing in. And the addictive nature with which I drink soda really just drew me to it to drink more of it. And after having a tolerance and not being affected by it at first, eventually it started to affect me again and make me very lethargic, like I said, to the point where I was sleeping way more than I was accomplishing things. And that's one of not only my Achilles heels, but I think one of ours as a society that soda can really do a lot of things. It also can make you very jittery. I know people who drink coffee can get very jittery. I'm not a coffee drinker, so I uh, just don't know that. I can't attest or testify on that, but for me with soda, it definitely makes me nervous and uh, can also make me, aggressive is not the word, but very irritable. That and watching too many politics can make me very irritable. Um, it's a very emotional thing with politics because you're thinking about the future of a country the future of the country you live in and it can be very very scary when you realize the direction we're going and what they may ultimately lead to uh, Thomas Jefferson said that the way our country is designed it is doomed for a reboot or civil war every 100 to 150 years. And we are just past that 150 year mark. 
almost a decade, a little over a decade, I guess you could say. No, maybe two or three years, actually. Because I'm doing, not doing math right in my brain. But it's because what happens is you establish general rules and with if power is not controlled, excessive power by federal government, and it is always controlled, then what happens is those people in power seek more of it, more control, more freedom for, them, for themselves, and less retribution for violating the laws, and more for everyone else. <laughs> and uh, I think we're at that place now, where those in power seek mo so much more of it that the best way to get it and to declare a country where votes no longer count, it's about their decisions, not ours, as a majority. We're at that place now. And it's a very scary time in our society. A very scary time, really in our world. And it will not get much better for a while. That's just reality. I was thinking about it because the other day, I genuinely don't think anyone who is supporting the Democrat Party intends any harm to anyone, nor do I believe those under the Republican Party intend any harm. I really believe they all think they're fighting for the are supporting the best approach to solve the problems and get us back on track or to create more equality. But equality is an idea that does not really exist because equality is in the eye of the beholder. Let me give you an example. <clears throat> Let's just take, for example, the marches and segregation, which happened back in the 60s. Well, black people were treated unfairly. They were segregated to schools that were not positive, uh, had poor education uh, because worst teachers, all kinds of things to it. And so they fought for more equality, which they had received. However, the challenge occurs is that at some point that equality is not enough because you're led by some people who say, well, we may have all the same rights but we don't have all the same respect. And so we get respect, we need more in order to balance the scales. We need, um, now they've been talking about getting, um, word escapes me, but some people have been talking about trying to get or is failing me right now, but essentially repayment of sorts for the nightmares that their ancestors endured under slavery. And then you have schools now saying that there's a lot of white supremacy in colleges, which really is just nonsense. There's so many white people that don't give a damn 
and I mean a majority of white people who really don't give a damn what your color of your skin is. But there are times now where white people can't get into colleges because they have to meet a diversity standpoint. It's no longer based on merit. It's now based on meeting a diversity quota. And when you start sacrificing quality for quota, you fall. You deteriorate to a point where you become poorly educated and improperly prepared people doing work. That would be the same as if it was black people were in the opposite perspective and white people were different. So the skin tone does not matter. It has nothing to do with your ethnicity. It's about good sense. And we lack good sense. We're now led by people who most especially want us divided. Because what happens when you're more divided is it's easier for people to come in the rulers, so to speak. In this case, they call it government to come in and say, well, no one can agree. So we're, we're gonna do what we feel is the best for you because we were the last people who you selected and we believe we can do it. And that's just a very dangerous place to get because once they assume that authoritarian control, the only way to change it is the revolution. That's what happened with George Washington and the like. And if you're looking for perfect people to lead the revolution, good luck. George Washington wasn't perfect. But what they realized was a government that had full authority over them was not a place where they could be free. I got up on a tangent because of that, but I suppose my point is my irritability has been higher when I listen to politics because I see this divide among us that will ultimately destroy us. And there's not going to be as a friend of mine said, there will not be a Mason Dixon line this time. It won't be the South versus the North. It's going to be neighbor versus neighbor, quite literally. And that's very scary. So I get really concerned about that. And soda for me is a point of irritation, helps to, um, makes me so antsy that I can become more <laughs> irritable. So I'm definitely eliminating that in my life. Again, it's really important that we be open to identifying the challenges that we create for ourselves and the things that bring us down, that prevent us from accomplishing things. Because it's the only way we can harness them, or not harness them, but uh, rein them in, which is probably the same as harness, <laughs> and uh, put them to the side and eliminate them so that they don't have as much control or influence and move on to things that help us to succeed. I was having dinner with someone the other night and 
we're talking about how nice it is and how much energy and positive vibe you get when you come into a home or a car that smells clean. How that can boost your self-esteem, how that can boost your energy because you feel like so much is done and accomplished already because so many people are afraid to have people in their homes because they don't keep it cleaned up properly. Especially with pets, this can happen. And things get broken more often, misplaced more often, and that creates irritability. And that vibe will linger, linger in your home. And I certainly know I like coming home to a clean home. And that's one of those things I was talking about putting in your schedule to create positive habits. 10 a.m. to 11 a.m. I clean, or whatever else it may be. Because the more that you nurture those positive habits, those positive um, motions and activities in your life, the more improves your psychology, uh, the more motivated, the more self-confident you can become. And there's a difference between confidence and arrogance. Knowing that you're doing well at something is one thing. Believing you're better than anybody else is another thing. There's a lady I dated one time who posted recently about how my boyfriend's better than your boyfriend. And I thought, um, okay, this is a relationship that's already doomed because she already has such an unrealistic belief as to what her boyfriend is that she's doing it for failure because he can't live up to that hype and eventually he will fall from grace so to speak and she'll go well he's really not that way one of my ex-girlfriends was the same way she was so used to going from one person to the next and she got bored with it that no man would ever live up to that expectation. As a matter of fact, to the best of my knowledge, even though she always looked for someone else to escape to, to transition to, when she was ready, I was the only one who actually broke up with her. <laughs> because I said, we're just fighting. We're not going the right direction. We're not being healthy for each other. And now she's trying to get a hold of me again for that reason. And I don't think it's about me being this amazing person. I think it's about wanting things that you don't have because you never got exactly what you wanted from them. And that's a healthy psychology. When a relationship ends, you should really just move on from it and go find something that's better for you. See, I can tell after having not done this for two days and just the saturation the sodas have in my body, I'm sweating more than I have in the last couple of days. All that stuff is coming out of my body. Relationships are hard things. Um, I was writing a dating profile the other night for my son. And so it's affected that too. It's affected my testosterone to some degree. Um, in the sense that 
I become less um, desiring of things. And it's not from a sexual standpoint. It's from a standpoint of... I should know how to describe this best. It gets me to a place where I feel like people get in the way. And I don't want them around because that irritation factor within my brain that's occurred because of poor eating habits makes me not a good partner for someone or even to talk to people. So really all this is about today, even though I jump from topic to topic is realizing what makes you less strong of mind and limiting your intake of things that create more irritability and irritability and things like that can make you lethargic things that numb your brain that don't fire off neutral neurons or protons or Antons or Anton, any of those things. You don't want things that will numb your ability or slow your ability to accomplish things or build tension within you. So just think about the things that might be in that way and try to limit your access to them. One of mine's and one of mine is others is binge, binge watching. I have seen a repeat of friends over and over again. I don't sit there and watch the show. I usually just listen to it in the background while I'm doing things. But that's the same thing. Because it becomes this consistent thing that I play in the background. And as a result of it, my mind can't go anywhere else because it has decided to have that noise in my head and when I have all that noise in my head I can't really be creative so put some music on or something very low in the volume in the background maybe something that's cheery that makes you happy I don't care you know for you it might be Snow White and the Seven Dwarves Beauty and the Beast whatever it is but don't make it something that's so obvious almost like subliminal that right <laughs> in my brain and processing did I say subliminal okay. I did at least I can say it now I don't know if I did it right before but I did it now all right off to another day I'll see you tomorrow take care of yourself and be well